Holy Spirit, thank you for the way you've been moving on us and shifting us. And Lord, we just want to align in time with whatever you have. So like I said earlier, Lord, and you know I meant it. You can trash the whole thing. I don't care. Just want you to connect hearts and minds to the Father here. Let it be done and let it be so. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, we'll see where this goes, right? You know me, I put, I get stuff, God downloads some words to me, and then I sit there and try to put together stuff that will make sense and connect the dots. And you all come from very different backgrounds. Some of you have been here a lot, some of you track with us, some not. So hopefully I won't make it too crazy. But did you like this picture? How many of you got and read the ping? Yeah, okay. And you read the scriptures too? Okay, good. See, I got you well trained now, you know. I'm ring a bell shortly and you're all salivate. No, that was dogs. Okay, I had all sorts of directions with trying trying to go here. The other one, a title I, I played with was, this was not in the brochure. Okay. But I feel concerned about this issue about great expectations or great faith. And I think sometimes they get confused and connected and anyway I, I'm I have a, a heart that we're how we as the body of Christ to move forward and how we're able to encourage all folks to move forward so let's go with that but first of all and ever had this look and that question how many of you are parents okay how many of you heard this before are we there yet okay hearing it once isn't really the problem the problem is when it keeps coming Right? Yes. At which point, what do you start to answer? What do you say after about the 15th Don't time? Don't ask me that again. Okay. Kim has this habit of doing that when we're on the road on long trips. And so I always answer. How do I answer? You answered, yes, we are the very first time I asked you. Uh, yeah. Yes, we are. No matter where we are. I said, we're actually sitting in the garage. All the scenery going by is just part of a green screen program just to help you transition back. But we're there. You know, it's just sometimes you got to just cut it short. But the issue is when a child gets in a car, right, there's an expectation about getting there, right? Especially now, it's, there's a lot more entertainment in a car today than there was when I grew up. <laughs> Okay, we had signs and A, S, E, and A, I see, you know, okay, the alphabet, the le license plate, okay. Now you got the whole thing. I mean, you can be just zoned out there. But the issue of that expectation about where you are versus a faith in who's driving and that the journey might be different and may stop different places. But, you, you know, as an adult, you shift some of that. Problem is, a lot of us are still kind of this way. So, let me just bring us back again into time. Okay, we're in the first biblical month, and it has an interesting play out in Scripture. So, you've got Egypt, wilderness, promised land. You've got the Red Sea, and you've got the Jordan. You got Pharaoh, Moses, and Joshua. You got slavery going on, and they cross over into freedom. And then, in this same, in this month. The Jews, the Israel, leaves Egypt and crosses into the wilderness. In this month, 40 years later, Israel leaves the wilderness and crosses into the promised land. So all that's going on in the midst of this. And so we're in a transition time. And the focus is not just about the crossing over, but it's about the expectation of what it was that you get when you're there. How many of you have felt like you've crossed over into something recently? Okay. How many of you are, it's just the way you thought? Okay. Uh, okay. Are you kidding me? This is just not okay. This was not in the brochure. I got to talk with God about it. Okay. Now, some of you have, but we cover this. We align with God's calendar because we believe that God anchored these things in time because there's things he wants us to pay attention to right now at his first month during his first feast of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, so that our mindsets are working on that throughout the year. So we're always mindful about how we cross into what's next. How many of you think you're going to have at least one transition this year? Okay. If not multiple transitions, right? Now, if you think you're not going to have one, I'm really sorry because God's going to have to deal with you roughly then. 
Because meanwhile, God is transitioning and He's moving. And if you are really His and His beloved, He's going to figure out ways to get you going there. Okay? Old thing about the farmer who couldn't get the donkey to move, couldn't get the donkey to move, right? Took out a two by four, hit him over the head. <laughs> Guy went, what are you doing? He says, well, I gotta get his attention first. Yeah. He says, oh, okay, sometimes God, yeah. two by four. Yeah. Any of you good with two by fours? Have yeah. them, okay. Yeah. Have the welts, we can compare welts in the back, okay. So, this time though, the issue is all the time when we transition, we really want to bypass most of the wilderness. Okay. No, 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 no. Just beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> right? We, we, love, we love those future shows because of the fact of the transport. Okay, that's cool. But the reality is we're really just going, are we there yet? Right? Okay, you know, and we're not, oh, okay, this isn't what I thought. God, are we, what are we, what are we, get, okay, and God's like, okay, calm down, right? When you were a child, you thought and acted as a child. When you became an adult, you needed to put those childish ways aside, right? Somebody said that once. Who was it? Paul. Paul, that's right. Okay, this is the Stephen Johnson translation. So let me zoom in a little bit more right here because we're in the first month. We're heading now towards the third month. Passover is this feast. Pentecost is that one. And this transition, the critical connection between these two is going to keep our focus and attention because there's a provision for us to advance to that next hot spot. And what happens at that hot spot? What happens there? What? The fire of God comes. The presence of God comes, right? He stands on the mountain and he speaks from the mountain. And they respond, of course, in great joy going, oh, no, right? So what does he do? He releases the law, the word, the teaching, the Torah. So we're looking towards that, and that word will come, but then you got to go through the scrub in the meanwhile. And then we leave Egypt because we're moving to cleave to God, right? We've talked again and again about leave, cleave, become one. We believe those are the three major points that he has with the feast. So we keep those, not in some religious way, but just in a way of continuing to move deeper into our relationship with God. And you want that, right? That is why you're here on a Thursday night of all nights in this crazy setup. You could have been a lot of other places watching a lot of other shows or whatever else. You chose to come here. Well, that hunger, we want to see how God's moving it. So, of course, we fast forward 1,500 years, the Passover, the cross, and the tomb. And it's still a critical connection and transition time because now the Pentecost is what? What's going to happen now? Okay, the power of the Holy Spirit. The tongues was a manifestation. It's not the main thing, right? It's the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is very clear, says, do not leave home without it. Okay, American Express, no, it's Gospel Express, okay? But there's this transition time, and it's always this craziness of, you know, this was not the way I thought it was going to be. And God is so intent that we keep these two big feasts connected that he put something else in here in Leviticus. It's also in Deuteronomy. From the day after the Sabbath, that's the Sabbath that you just had, Resurrection Sunday, okay? Some call it Easter. We call it Resurrection Sunday. From the day after that Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, barley, count off seven full weeks. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath and then present an offering of new grain wheat to the Lord. So God is so intent that he set it up. He said, okay, guys, Passover is great. I need you to celebrate that. But every day I want you to make a wave offering before me. Count the omer. That's what it's called. And then count up. One, two, three. Yeah? So God has set with Pentecost and Passover this link first day, second day, and he's so clear that we are keep it connected that he created a whole set of days to go in between and ultimately he's linking it like this chain because the problem is with everybody's attitude of aren't we there yet, right? We get to Passover, we go through the crucifixion, resurrection, okay, we're done. God's like, no, you got a good start, okay? You got a good start. Yes, you are complete in him, but I have much more. And then every year he takes us back into the cycle because he wants us to go another layer. And because of that, we're supposed to move from blessing to blessing. And during this time, there's offer preparation and expectation of what's happening. You all tracking with this? I'm doing it kind of fast. We've covered some of this before. 
So here's the question. Great faith or is it great expectations? Are those the same or are they different? Talk to me. Expectation is hope. Expectation is hope. Okay. What's the difference between faith and hope? When I think of expectation, uh, it, it has the spin of what I want. What I perceive is going to come, going to happen. But when I think of great faith, my perception is, uh, God, what did you think is going to happen? What do you want to happen? And then I align with Him on it and not myself. Okay. And I'm able to, when, when I'm in really good faith, then I'm able to lay down my expectations and say, Lord, whatever you want is bad. Okay. So how do you, did you get that, right? Often it's a way that we put, think about this. Faith is assurance of things hoped for. The problem is a lot of times there are things that we hope for that often don't have really all that much to do with faith. They can start out as that way, like right? Provision, health. Said it right, but and we have this tension to walk in, because it is by His stripes we are healed, right? So healing is available, but if I set healing as my expectation, okay, and it doesn't happen, now some people will say, well, that's just my faith actualized, okay, but there's there's a very dangerous place in there, right? And we've seen it. The challenge is we can go to the other side. Well, it's, it's nothing about but about your relationship with Jesus. Okay, but is there a tangible aspect to that? Is there a manifestation of his favor in this life? Or are you just going to look the same? Are you going to be poor and homeless, disheveled, diseased, etc.? Jim. I think one word to help clarify that to me is great faith is seeing it from God's perspective and great expectation to see it from my perspective. Okay. Okay. That's what I was doing. Good. Yeah. That shift in there. Now, let me just throw this at you because I wish it was always that easy and black and white. Right? When you've gotten a word, you have a promise of God about something and you're going back and you're going back. Remember the the widow and the unjust judge and she kept after him and she kept after him and she kept after him and Jesus says this is a model there is a way in which we are to come in faith and and be after God for what's there there is an expectation about his goodness the challenge is sometimes I've been around enough folks that are sometimes where that manifestation when it's going to happen and how it's going to happen becomes very concrete <laughs> And that feels real dangerous because at that point in time, if he doesn't fit that expectation, then what happens to my faith? Yeah, I tend to get those blurred rather than keeping them distinct. So there's always this thing for me about how am I connecting into the heart of God? Am I connecting into the heart? Am I trusting him? I was, I don't know if I'll get more time to tell you about a conversation on the plane on the way back from Texas with this woman who'd been deeply hurt by men a number of times. And then we shifted into the conversation about God. And she goes, well, I used to pray. I was a teenager and I prayed and prayed my grandmother wouldn't die. And when she died, I didn't pray anymore because clearly I saw it doesn't work. Okay. Now there was an expectation and the enemy build that up as the only basis for judging whether or not there really was a God or whether he cared about her. And she was like, you know, if that's the way he is, then I don't want anything to do with him. Yeah? Okay. That's an example, but I think we have this issue all the time, especially when we're making a transition from one thing into another. So I'm going to try to quickly go through stuff. You ready for it? Say yes. 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 Okay, good. So expectations out of Egypt. Okay. What were the expectations when they were in Egypt about getting out. Talk to me quickly. Everything is going to go great. Everything's going to go great. What else? Instant Free. rescue and provision and safety and ease and comfort. Ease, comfort, safety, yeah. instant rescue. What else? Freedom. Freedom. Yeah. What else? 
Joy, joy. Okay, yeah. How many? No more oppressive enemies. No more oppressive enemies. No more enemies. You know, we're getting out of here. So, you know, what God had said is, I will bring you out into the land flowing in milk and honey. So, what's the expectation as soon as you get out? Where's, the Where's my milk and honey? Yes. Okay, right? Okay. So. The issue almost always is what God says, though, versus what we hear. Any of you have this issue? Okay. This is why if God gives me something, I think he's stirring something in me, I always, instead of saying, thus says the Lord or something, is this is what I'm hearing. Because I'm aware that he's speaking something into my heart, into the spirit, but it's got to get its way through this. And this is sort of, you know, depending upon the day and the week and the hour, a little bit polluted, confused, whatever, distorted. Hopefully not. Hopefully I'm moving and he can, in freedom in that, and he can flow and speak. But I'm very aware of the difference between those two. So let's just look at this. Then Moses and the children of Israel, this is once they get out on the other side of the Red Sea, right? Just a quick contrast. They're all excited and they start singing, I will sing the Lord. He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider, he is thrown into the sea. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Yeah? You, you read this, right? It's in Exodus 15. And it's a wonderful, wonderful time of praise. They've just seen this whole thing right after that. Then they went out in the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. That's why the title was, This Was Not in the Brochure. <laughs> Where's the milk and honey? This is right. So, this, and what does that do then? The expectation starts to erode away on the faith, on the relationship. And so, now when they came to Mara, they could not drink the water at Mara, for they were bitter. So even when they see water, <gasps> oh, water, yay! And they try to taste it, and it's bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara, which means bitter. So, expectation, disappointment. Water, <gasps> expectation, <sighs> disappointment, right? Just. You see this kind of thing, and it's like, okay, the question of alignment in faith versus the expectation. And of course, God takes care of that. When the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And he goes on to say, makes a promise, if you align with me, if you follow all of my commands, I am the Lord your healer. And I won't bring any of the diseases of Egypt against you, right? But again, it's not the expectation versus the faith. Yeah, I'm going to keep going. So, great expectations coming from the wilderness, about to go into the promised land. Okay, tell me about those expectations now. Come on. Coming into the so now you've been you've been out there, and you're thinking, okay, we've been in the wilderness all the time. Now we're going to cross finally into the promised land. Okay, so you're fast forwarding now. Okay, I'm doing another transition the same month. Same things they would have been dealing with that many of us are dealing with. What's the expectation before they go over into the promised land? What are they thinking? Are you thinking about after the spies have gone out and come back? Spies gone out and come back. So now, now this is this is when they're actually ready to go. Okay. No, this is when this is with Joshua and they're ready to go. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I think they knew they had to fight. Think they knew they had to fight. Okay. What what else? Are they excited? I, I, don't, I, don't know that, I don't think that they are. Uh, you don't know that they are. Okay, well, go <laughs> bedraggling. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe confidence. Well, they're all wilderness with great expectation, and now they're going over here, and they've already heard about these giants, so they're like, if the wilderness was worse than what I thought, okay. they already know these giants are bad. It could be really bad. Okay. <laughs> So here's the challenge. What you're saying then is that they were all basically pretty faithless. I also think, though, that they're like, hey, let's be done with this and go on. I mean, if this is what this has been like and everybody had to die, let's go on and go somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. yeah. I'm tired of I think mean, there's a little bit of that. Too. Yeah. So there's probably some trepidation in yeah. there, but. Yeah, I think it, yeah. The whole generation had to die. Not, not excited, but resolved. Maybe yeah, that's resolved. Way to put it. I don't know. I think okay. the circumcision is probably woke them all up. Pardon me? I think the circumcision is probably woke them all up. Well, let's, let's get to that. 
So I think when they would have left, originally they would have thought an expectation, hey, the same guy who let us out is going to lead us in, right? Because he had the original word. That's going to change. God will drive all of our enemies out. God had said that. Now, they had rebelled at one point, but now all those people who had rebelled are dead. Okay? We made it through the trials. Yeah, I think we're good to go now. Okay? All the faithless ones. Don't you see how they... Can you imagine the number of graves in the wilderness? I mean... Who actually believes? Well, I, that's right. And Caleb. The ones who believe old. from the original, but now this whole generation, God said, I had to cleanse it out. But I kind of think this is sort of easy peasy because He's on our side. I think there's got to be a level of confidence in this. Okay, no, I really do because I think they saw that. I'm sorry, I had a sister who, five years older, and did everything the hard way with my folks. It was a constant fight, and you know what? I five years later. I sit there and I would watch that and go, okay, that ain't working. <laughs> that approach ain't the way it's going to do. I think this generation could see enough of their parents dragging around until they died in the wilderness going, well, that ain't working. And this God is still with us because that pillar of cloud is still moving. So I'm going to stay here. I think there's a sense of, you know what, we're going to be confident in this, because there's no sense of them not being prepared to cross this at that second time, right? You get that? Yeah. Okay. But again, what God says versus what we assume, so it was, there's a sense of joy when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. Right? Does this sound like a, we will, we will rock you. Okay, right there. They are ready. Okay. Which is great. But again, that's the expectation. And so what happens next? Not quite. No. <laughs> they ain't ready for Jericho. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeath Harloth. Now, what was the oldest man who was circumcised there? Joshua Well, consider this, that all those who were of war age, which was 20 and above, Joshua and Caleb were already circumcised because yeah. they were circumcised in Egypt. No one was circumcised out in the wilderness. But that means that anyone who was 19 and younger would have been spared. It's been 40 years. That means you've got at least some that are 59-year-old men getting circumcised with flint knives. <laughs> okay, we got, we got bris today. Take a line, take a number, we'll get you quick. Okay. Special two for one. You have to be aware that sometimes God crosses you over. You've gotten into a great faith place. You've spent your wilderness time. You've gotten rid of a lot of that stuff that was just in you from the prior season. You're ready to go. And the first thing he does is set you down and wound you. There's something old that's got to go. Any of you had that? So now they're in enemy territory. They're not able to fight and they have to be there behind enemy lines. And God's like, okay, let's make really clear you know who's calling the shots and who's your strength. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Okay. When the circumcision of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Not able to walk around, do much of anything. So you go from the excitement to the circumcision to then this. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Forty years of bearing that reproach. We don't know how many graves, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of graves out there, right? The reproach. But the kids were still carrying it. And so there was a need to get it cut off. Okay, so we got that done good. But then there's a recalibration again right after this. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us? 
or for our adversaries? Right and logical question, right? By the way, do you know who this is? When it says the angel, when, it, when, it, when this, well, I'll, I'll get there. So he said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. You know, we get to this point where we've been working on with something God so much, so much, so much. And so we think, well, God, God's for me. Okay, it's all going to do. And, and the angel, the reason we know this is a pre-incarnate Christ, right, is because Joshua will fall down and worship him. And if it's an angel, the angel will always say, don't do that. But I love this because his question, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he's like, you don't get it. I'm commander of the Lord's army. It's not a question of who am I with. It's a question of who you with. <laughs> See, there's an expectation. Okay, we're going to go. We're going to go to do it. And Jesus shows up and says, you got to get clear about this. Your expectation that this you're just going to do is, isn't it. Are you with me or not? Yeah? Okay. So, the question about are we there yet? Okay, I love this picture of this kid. That, that's got, it's just, we have this same thing. God takes us into something. We cross over something new starts, a new job, a new ministry, a new position. Somebody gets married. Kids come in. All these transitions come and come and come. But then it's, it's just different than we thought. And so, again, this ex question about faith or expectations. And I wanted to show you something that's not... I haven't completely formed it, but I couldn't get away from it. So I'm going to throw it at you and show you. Five degrees of separation. I want to just show you on this journey real quickly. So we start out in Egypt, right? And we have the Jews there. You clear enough with that, right? I have limitations on my stick figure art. So anyway. Okay. And then, of course, there's a confrontation that comes. Pharaoh and Moses, right? What happens next? All the plagues start coming down, right? And be when the plagues, the first three hit everybody, and then after the first three, what happens? There's a separation between Goshen. And so the first degree of separation is when you're in a hostile environment, surrounded by that, and God does not move you out at all, but he begins to show a demarcation. Do you get this? A separation out. You could have had that happen in a work situation, in relationships. You're still there, still involved in it, but the favor of God starts to show up, and you see other things manifesting around you. Okay, second degree. Pharaoh finally agrees. Okay, you can go. So yay, everybody joins up. Okay, they all saddle up in volume. But then, of course, we know what happens. Pharaoh changes his mind. You gotta like how fast these guys move, right? <laughs> but then something happens, right? Because again, they're out of that context. But now they're being pursued and chased. You've often been in a situation where the authority of what you left, even though you've left the environment, is still trying to get after you. And so the Lord sends a pillar of cloud, a fire and cloud. And if you read it carefully, you will see that it is actually the angel of the Lord. Once again, it's the angel of the Lord who's appearing it. And he is separating those two out. It's the second degree of separation. It's places and times when you've pull, been pulled out of a situation, but there's still harassment that's following you, and the Lord will literally bring in a second degree of, of separation. You know, again, then they get across the Red Sea, right? Looks good, except, once again, these guys are very persistent. Bada, 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 bada. Okay. But once more, boom. And God begins to just take vengeance on his enemies. And so now there's a third degree where God has literally created a physical boundary. But each time they think, okay, we're getting better, we're getting better, we're getting better. But the reality was, even though they had left Egypt now, even though he delivered them from that persecution, from those plagues, from the uh, assault of the enemy, there's still a spirit of slavery that's in them, right? And so there's another degree of separation that's got to happen now out in the wilderness. And we know part of how that happens is you've got to have that whole generation that rebelled has got to die out there. But not only that, the person who led them out also can't lead them in. And all that's got to go. This represents that fourth degree. And then they get there. And of course, it opens up. They get through. And then when it closes behind, now you've got that fourth degree. Now they've left that wilderness season behind. Okay? All that's been done, but there's one thing that remains, and the reproach of Egypt is still on them. Yeah? 
So one more time, God's got to bring another separation. That circumcision means to cut, and now that's that fifth degree of separation. I'm throwing a lot at you real quick. We could just talk in this. Okay. Just bear it as a concept, okay? Just say five degrees of separation. Five degrees of separation. Just need you to know that a lot of times when God is moving you from A to B, there's all these crossovers, there's all this transition, there's a lot of blessing, but meanwhile, you got to watch your expectation for what it's going to look like. Because often there's more and another layer that he's got to deal with. Okay? And so we've got all these things. You've got the presence, you've got the leadership, you've got harassment, you've got slavery, and you've got this reproach. And one by one, God's got to come through and separate and separate and separate and separate. And only then does he get enough of the people there who have both an attitude of worship and an attitude of, I'm ready to go and get it done. Five degrees of separation. Where are you in this process? Just so you know. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah. A lot of time it's painful. And so the question, where are you in that and how is it going? Because each one of these, when God moves on our behalf, right? Goshen, he moved on their behalf. The pillar, he moved on their behalf. The Red Sea, he moved on their behalf. Okay? The Jordan opened up, moved on their behalf. Circumcision, moved on their behalf. But it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. And the hurt is often, right, not physically, it's in our expectation. Oh God, we thought. So with that, let's look at the great expectation of the disciples in Jerusalem. What were the expectations of the disciples in Jerusalem? Talk to me. This is pre-crucifixion. What were their expectations? Earthly kingdom. Earthly kingdom. Okay. What else? What does that mean? Going to overthrow Rome. Right. That's right. What's it going to mean for us as followers? Leadership. What? Leadership. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Places of importance. Places of importance. Okay. How are people going to treat us? Well, yeah. 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 We're going to have, it's going to be, we're going to be fat and happy, right? I mean, no, no. You got, think about it. If you were one of David's mighty men, okay, but you knew where he was heading, you knew the kingdom he was going to have, right? You're going to, you're going to tough it out because, you know, one day I'm going to rule and reign. I'm going to have it. So, okay. He's going to establish the, king, the kingdom of his father David. That means it will look like this. We're going to rule and reign with him. Every knee will bow and tongue confess. The Romans will know it. The Jewish leaders will know it. And no more hiding, right? They've been just kind of going, okay. So, all of that puts us in this story then on the road to Emmaus. Somebody pick up that microphone. I'm going to have somebody read. Jackie, you're right there. Why don't you start? You can hand it over there. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together all of these things which had happened. Now, question, why do I have a man and a woman in this shot? Pardon me? Yeah, there's a reason for this, just so you know. Um, Anytime you see it depicted, it's usually showing two guys because it says disciples. Okay? Okay, stop. You're trying to pass the microphone instead of pass the buck. <laughs> I know. My, I'm just so compelling as a speaker. So. I don't want it. Here, you take it. Give it to Mikey. He'll eat it. He'll eat anything. If you're watching this replay... I need you to understand the spiritual maturity we, room we have in the room here, it, it varies a lot. Not just by person, but by time of day and what's going on. Some of them drank their dinner before they got here. So. Okay, well, let me, later on you're going to see that this guy's name is Cleopas. That's the Greek up there, if you can see it. And what's interesting, if you go in the 19th chapter of John, you will find that one of the women who was present at the crucifixion was the wife of Clopas. And because they're so similar and so close, it's not uncommon within Greek names to have them spelled different ways at different times. So they're pretty clear that Cleopas is the husband of the woman Mary that was at the cross. 
So you need to shift that in your orientation of the conversation these two are having. Because we know none of the disciples followed him up there, right? But the women did. Mary Magdalene? Mary Magdalene was one of those. Mary, his mother. Was the wife of the Cleos? No, no. Mary Magdalene was, there's another. Yeah, read John 19 and you'll see. There's five total in there and she's one of them. Okay? So it makes sense that the two of them are there. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Don't you love Jehovah Sneaky? Okay, who's going to read now? Do we have somebody brave enough to have the microphone? Okay, there we go. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. By the way, that word in the Greek restrained is literally to like hold somebody back. This is not that they were just confused. Their eyes were restrained. God sometimes makes us blind for a time because these are two people who have now crossed over, but they think they've crossed over into hell. Right? They don't get it. The dots haven't connected. This is not what we expected. Okay, now you can get going. And when he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of those whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? You, you got this, right? I mean, they, they are in deep grief. They are trying to process it. Pretty clear it's husband and wife. I'm guessing she gave all the details of what she saw, right? This was not a third-hand report that Jesus was dead, right? So Jesus, cunning as he is, comes alongside and starts to draw out these expectations, right? Okay, I'll finish this one line. I'm going to have you read some more. And he said to them, what things? He doesn't jump in. He's going to keep drawing out. I need you to bear this in mind because when you transition into something and there's this dashed expectations, you need to let Jesus draw these things out. Oh, I'm fine, God, I'm fine. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I, doesn't it, does it ever amaze you how frequently we try to hide something from God yeah. Yeah. I, it's just like so stupid right it's just like give me a break I, you know it's like the kid with that mouthful of cookies more oh, cookies <laughs> I you know, you cookies second grade green now later I didn't eat it I you know <laughs> Just <laughs> okay, keep going. Oh, microphone. We got to put that button up. There you go. So they said to him, "The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him." But we are hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Okay, key phrase in here, right? One, they've already kind of lowered how they're talking about him. They thought he was what? Prophet. Prophet. Mighty indeed in word. But I, this line with a but, but we were hoping that it was he. That phrase right there. Okay, let's keep going. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had seen also, that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it was just, it was just the women had said but him they had not seen. Okay, good. What's this a picture of? Natural stone. Yeah. Heart. Yeah, it's it's stone. It's a stone thing, but it's it's a picture of a heart. Okay, let's keep going here. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Wow. How long was this walk? 
Seven miles. How long would that take? Hours. Yes. A couple hours is usually a couple hours. Now, if you're depressed and grieving, how fast do you walk? Yeah, I think you're kind of you're kind of moving slowly, right? There's just not much energy, much life. Yeah. So I think this conversation. Can you imagine though? He is now downloading. He is starting from the beginning. But a boom. So, this is all moving. He's addressing them. When they drew near to the village where they were going, he indicated that he would have gone farther. I love this. Right? He, he, he's playful. He's checking them. Okay, I've just dropped all this stuff on them. Let's see what they do with it. Do you, do you understand there's a, something here that God is shifting in us to say, look, I am going to engage you. I'm going to draw out all that stuff. And then I'm going to start speaking into you. And then I'm going to do something. I'm going to see if you respond. Okay? The bush was burning. Moses saw it. But it's only when Moses saw it and turned and said, I'm going to see what that is that God spoke to him. So often God's looking for some kind of response to us Instead of going, uh, you know, all those arguments were nice. Thank you very much. He's dead. You know, what's, what's, what, the, what? Instead, they, there's something drawing them in and they constrained him. Do you remember that word about their eyes were? Okay, same Greek word here. Saying, abide with us for it's toward evening and the day is spent. And he went in to stay with him. And of course, you know what happened. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Wow. By the way, do you like this painting? Yes. It's a guy named Barry Motes. And this is actually his modern-day interpretation of the road to Emmaus meal in a rest stop at Kentucky Fried Chicken with a husband and wife breaking bread. So you got you got to bring it into into your world now that he engages them in their world and then they invite him to dinner and it's only in that moment. And they said to one another, did our heart burn within us? Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? I need you to get this. When did their heart burn? While he was talking, did they know who he was? Okay. You, you got to get that the Lord will begin to download scriptures and truth to you through any number of different sources, and you won't even get why it's coming. It might come a piece of truth through a movie, a billboard, somebody who doesn't even know Jesus will say something to you, and God is just, and inside you're just, you can feel it. You can feel it. The more that you get a radar for hearing what the Spirit is saying, he just will do that. And the great news is then, I think, for us, when we have the opportunity to speak life to somebody about the Word, and it really is life, to try to draw out. But see, first Jesus tries to hear the source of their pain, and then he begins to speak into it to show them all these things, right? But their hearts were burning within him. I mean, there's something so engaging about what we can do as well. But I love this. Then they rose up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together. How long did the return trip take? Sure. Yeah, I'm guessing somewhere, yeah, really fast. Because were they excited now? Were they they're just like but can you imagine they're they're having bread, they're just kinda had this amazing meal and your guest there has been really helpful. He's obviously some sort of teacher and he, he blesses the bread and breaks it and suddenly you go <gasps> Right? Especially if you were that Mary, wife of Clopas, and you last time you saw him was up there all bloodied up and something <gasps> right? You're just Jehovah sneaky. Why did they recognize him when he blessed? Pardon me? Why did they recognize him? Good question. Why did they recognize him? Because he allowed them to see him. You mean at the end? Mm -hmm. No, when, when, when he broke bread. Right. 
what was in that experience. What do you think? Good question. I think it was the bread of life. Bread of life? And okay. They, saw the, they saw the life. They okay. felt the life. They experienced the life. Okay. Because that's who he is. Okay. Yeah, a lot of times when we're seeing a message from him and he doesn't reveal it until the very end and all of a sudden it just clicks. Oh, that's what this means. See, I think it goes all the way back to it says, and they were restrained from seeing him. That is just not a passive verb. That is an active blindness. So here you go. Let me throw this at you. When you're dealing with expectations that were not what you thought, and you're disappointed and you're hurt, God may be speaking to you through somebody and you don't even recognize it until later. Don't turn the lights off. You know what? I mean, you will not. Sometimes he's got to keep you blind for a time so he can drop certain things in. Because if he just showed up, you'd be like, wow, you're here. He needed to lay something else down for them in that dark walk to Emmaus. He had to give them a basis for understanding so that they could go. Seeing him was one thing. Understanding more how it fit in was bigger deal. Because you're all here. And with few exceptions, you haven't literally physically seen Jesus. But your understanding of him as a suffering Messiah was critical. Okay? So, washed with the water, the washing of the water of the word. It is just amazing when God comes in and ignites something out. So, let me close with a couple things here. Y'all know I get time in the morning with the Lord and I just try to part of that time after prayer and some study and I just I get on my laptop I journal to him and I'm just in a conversation and seeing what he stirs up and I was in this thing about the road to Emmaus and um, and he started to talk to me about that he frequently sometimes easier to read what I heard so what will happen for those of you who don't know um, I'll be doing, I'll be just saying things and suddenly I will hear, I'll have a sense that he's starting to say something. So I'll stop and I'll just write, type out the first three words or something and then it keeps going. And, uh, but he was saying this, I thought it was interesting. The way along the road is how I like to engage my people. They always want to stop at some place in time, but I prefer to speak while they're on the journey. I come alongside and pose the questions in their heart. I draw up and out the dashed expectations. But then they will not listen to what I say in response. They harden their hearts from the truth. You saw this with the woman on the plane. You drew up the sorrow in her heart and you spoke into it. But then as you tried to help her correct her course and thoughts about me, she pushed back to stay in her hole rather than emerge into the light. I am your way forward in this. I am he who has come alongside in your disappointments about so many things. He began to speak some more, but then this is the phrase as he continued to talk. I make myself strong in your behalf. It is my plans that are to be established, not your expectations that are to be protected. It is my plans that are to be established, not your expectations that are to be protected. You get that? There is more. I am he who moves when and where I choose, agree with my plan of warfare, and do not hold me back. So, let me give you one other part. Oh, sorry? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Kim, I don't know if you'll need to adjust the camera or not. I wasn't sure if I was going to do this. I'm still not sure it's a good idea. <laughs> but you know me, sometimes. So let me tell you, that was yesterday morning when he gave me this. And this morning I was before him and he's just, have any of you still trying to process some of your disappointments with God? Yes. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> well, I was recently in a situation in a place where there's a source of a number of disappointments. Things I thought were going to go a certain way didn't, right? And so I just was with him and, and was working on what he was wanted to say and this whole idea of this degrees of separation 
and sometimes they'll just show me a picture. And this morning I'm there, and I, I just suddenly I get a picture of what is looks like my heart, but it's not my heart. Instead, it's kind of this mess, like kind of yarn or rope twined around that's like covered in black tar. And I'm like, okay, that ain't good. <laughs> So, made a heart, yeah. Some of this I need to get his words, and I'm not sure how I'm going to do this without getting myself completely messed up with paint and all. Can I hit the kind of way? Uh, maybe. So this is what I wrote to him. What's inside of me looks just like a black mass of greasy yarn covered in pitch. It's tangled, seemingly impossible to unwind. It's slimy to the touch and dark to the eye. Yuck! It seems like an evil heart of unbelief, my lord. What need you do with this? Why am I seeing that? I know enough to know that it is not my true heart. You gave me a new one long ago, yet it is the picture that I see now. It is a lot how I feel about myself in this. Seems my sense of inadequacy in my walk with you has been a big focus. But none of this is about me, it's about you. You are the hero of this story and I belong to you. And then I was writing that there's something in here where sin is abound, grace can more so abound. I do not want the black crud but when it does come, if I bring it to you, will you deal with it? And then I was seeing the fibers. I guess I got to just try to do this. Okay. So. I'm going to put this on something because it might just cover me. You got it? It's not a lollipop, really. So, I wanted to give you an idea. What he was speaking to me about is that dashed expectations end up kind of wrapping around our heart. And bit by bit, Oh boy. What was pure and clean just starts to get entangled. Does any of you feel like this sometimes? better that I not shake hands with anybody on the way out. But then what I saw I keep seeing the fibers of the torch head, the yarn type of string that is wound up to make the head. Why is that important, my lord? Would you please just speak into this? And this is what I heard. Because doubt and unbelief do not come in a massive overlay because they come around to bind your true heart bit by bit, layer by layer. You allow them to cling to your heart, these disappointments and fatigue of spirit. They constrain and hold your heart back, but still you allow them and tolerate them, and they build up more and more and more. 
At any time you can see them and ask that I consume them, and so I shall. The issue is not that they come against you and that you receive them. The issue is that you tolerate them rather than simply turn to me and allow me to burn them off. Precept upon precept is often how they work. It is rarely the biggest thing, it's the small things, bit by bit by bit. You see also that each strand is woven of many cords. There are smaller threads that combine to make the large. So it is how small agreements against my heart for you will co combine to cover your heart and the glory that I have set within you. All of this comes along in a process, subtle, calculated, persistent, consistent. But if you know the strategy, then you can bring it to me and I will use it as fuel to the fire. Because then, <laughs> pray for this part. What I saw was he lit it up. And it became a torch. And then I saw him pick it up and wave it as a signal. You see, what he was showing me is that all that garbage could then be used to set my heart on flame again. The reason this is important, I think a lot of the disappointments for a lot of people can lead to a shipwreck of faith. And I think within the prophetic community, we understand the power of signs and wonders and healing and prophecy, and we know that. But we have to walk with people. We have to walk with discernment. What we hear versus what God said, what we assume versus where his heart is. We want it to manifest. We're sure it's going to manifest in a specific way. Those two disciples on the road did not have an ungodly expectation of the Messiah. Will Jesus restore the kingdom of God? Yes. Will the Romans bow? Yes. Will all other leadership bow? Yes. Okay. All of that, will they rule and reign? Will you rule and reign? Yes. All of it's true. This question of how and when. But so the disappointment curled around their heart and Jesus had to go and speak to it. And then when he leaves, they go, oh, didn't our hearts burn within us? What I want to show you is that very place of disappointment, if we let him meet us and speak into it and then give it to him and then give it to him, this is what he said here. It will create the fuel for the fire to reignite you because he'll meet us in that place. He'll speak into it and say, you know what? I know you missed that. It's okay. I am still here. I haven't left you. I haven't forsaken you. I know you wanted it this way. That's not what I had in mind. You see time in a very short circle. I see it with all eternity. I've got the long game in mind. Wage a good warfare, having faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected that and concerning their faith have suffered, suffered shipwreck. Sometimes we can get to the place where we almost shipwreck our faith. So the question of great faith, great expectations. Great faith will lead to the right kind of expectations provided it's true faith in him and not necessarily in a specific thing that you want him to do. So, what's driving you? Are we there yet? <coughs> Scotty. Earlier, um, I guess when Gail, um, when they had that word, what came to me was about cleaning our vessels, daily repentance. And that's when you show that, all those little things, they get in the heart. And if we don't repent, 
and it keeps building up and building up and building up. And then God cannot get through there until we repent and we ask him. So I, I feel like John the Baptist, repent, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand to keep our hearts clean. Amen. So, Father, I suspect there's a lot of old disappointments in this room. Places where there's some of that twine wrapped around. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would show it if they can't see it. Now, if you have any of that, I want you to just, in your heart, in your mind, just bring it to Him. See it in your mind. See the chords. Open your heart up. And say, bring the fire. Bring the fire. Bring the fire. Lord, cause all that old stuff to ignite to set our hearts on fire again, to give us the passion. Their hearts burned within them when they heard you speak. And they raced back. Back on purpose, back on task, recalibrated. Lord, help us to have great faith and the right expectations that flow from that. In the name of Jesus. Amen.